Supermax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Thanks for joining us for our roundup of lifestyle news in Europe. This is what we have coming up on the show today. Saddle Up, an annual horse racing event, hits the beach in Spain. Crossover concert, former classical pianist Vika now performs heavy metal. And in the swing, kicking is the latest extreme sport and it comes from Estonia. If horses are racing, it's usually on a grass track. But in the most southern province of Spain, there's an annual race on the beach. The former fishing village of San Luca de Baramida used to use horses to transport fish. And so the tradition of racing them evolved from there. Since 1845, the competition has continued to grow in diversity and prestige. And it's now a major summer highlight for the Andalusians. Each year in August, the beach in the Spanish city of San Luca de Barameda is transformed into a horse racing track. More than 20 races give jockeys the chance to win money and the respect of the locals. It's just different because horses usually race on a track, not the beach. My mother is from San Lucar. I come here every year. I like the atmosphere. The beach is spectacular. Watching the races as the sun goes down. You don't get this anywhere else. A few hours earlier, San Lucar was basking peacefully in the midday sun. But by race time, the beach is crowded with locals and tourists alike. It's first come, first served for the best seats in the house. It's tense as the jockeys get ready ahead of the action. One of the top amateur riders is Graciela Rodriguez, a 27-year-old local. To win here in my home city in San Lucar is very important for me. San Lucar is my life. It's my city, where I grew up. The younger jockeys could take a leaf out of Javier Hidalgo's book. He's been racing here for more than 30 years. And he's a keen spectator, too. There's a feeling of being in a full speed and, and dominating the field. Well, you have to be very fit. And you have to be to have an enormous capacity of breathing. Yeah. Um, you have to be very flexible. The whole body, you see the position they take on the, on the saddle. Um, and you have to be strong. Graciela Rodriguez trains every day with her horse in the morning and stamina training in the afternoon. The beach conditions are more challenging than on a track. Javier Hidalgo knows all about the history of the races. They started with fishermen who galloped along the beach with their catch. I can recognize people here who are probably from my grandfather generation, like this gentleman here and the one on, on the scale. And in, in those days, uh, we were racing the other side, while now we are racing from the very east to the very west. Graciela is on her way to the starting point. It's the last race of the year, and some 35,000 spectators are looking on. Even the youngest ones are laying bets. They have special kids' bookies, so everyone can join in the fun. These two 11-year-olds have made their minds up about who will win, and their logic is flawless. Number three, because I really like the name. The moment of truth has come for Graciela. She's racing for a prize of 10,000 euros. And competition is fierce. I'm just totally excited. <laughs> And they're off. The horses race across 1,400 meters.
reaching speeds of up to 75 kilometers an hour, they can cover that distance in just two and a half minutes. So far, so good for Graciela. But three of her competitors are closing in. She holds them off, though. Her Irish stallion comes in first by more than a length. It's a triumph for Graciela. The horse's heart was beating faster and faster. I was so excited. And then I won. That now brings the racing season in San Lucar to a close. The beach belongs to the sunbathers again, at least until next August. Well, classically trained pianist Vika has become known not for her classical music performances, but for playing heavy metal. This genre of music has always been a passion of hers, and since posting her interpretations online, she's gained a following that now allows her to tour with her piano and share her style of music with the world. Metallica instead of Mozart. Classically trained pianist Victoria Yermolyeva, better known as Vika, is currently touring Germany, playing covers of heavy metal and rock songs. In Berlin, she's performing at the club SO36, a favorite haunt of punk and hard rock fans. What an experience seeing her on the stage. It's wild. The way she gets into the songs, body and soul, it was ultra cool. Really impressive. She's just incredible. On her tour, Vika plays songs like Raining Blood by American thrash metal icon Slayer. Arranged for piano and drums, it might even win over non-metal heads. I sometimes had reactions from people saying that they don't like all the noise of original songs, but when it's on piano, they actually can hear that the compositions are good. So it seems that some people discovered metal and rock because on piano arrangement, it's just clear what music is about. Vika began taking piano lessons when she was just four, at first in her hometown of Kiev, Ukraine, and later elsewhere in Europe. She won countless prizes and played with various orchestras, but danced the nights away in heavy metal clubs. I was sort of dragged into like going to competitions or like, I was always told to do that. I was never the one to pick up. Even when I was in my 20s, it was still decided for me, so I figured that it's not exactly my thing. But all that changed in 2006, when Vika decided to follow her true passion and gave up her classical music career. Since then, her piano arrangements of classic metal and rock tunes have earned her a rapidly growing fan base on the internet. Vika never runs out of ideas for songs and simply plays what she likes. Her YouTube channel has racked up more than 77 million views. One of my first covers was this upcoming new single from Metallica from Death Magnetic. And when I uploaded it on YouTube, I even I skipped totally the hard part. I only played the soft part and then the ending. And then I suddenly started receiving all these messages and like comments and I was like, oh wow, people like it. Today, Vika can live from her passion from performances, sales of sheet music, and donations from her fans. 
But most importantly, she's the master of her own destiny. When it comes to concerts, it is of course a relief because I have a lot more I prefer this kind of stage. When I was a classical pianist, I was sometimes daydreaming about how to make it less, you know, like fancy because it's like just really not me. Now Vika is being true to herself and she's working on the next stage of her career, creating arrangements for her first official CD. From music, we turn to film, as the 71st Venice Film Festival is already underway. 80-year-old Marina Cicogna has been connected to the festival since an early age, as it was her grandfather who first established the event. She grew up to become a successful film producer and is still heavily involved in making sure that the prestigious event runs as smoothly as possible. On the red carpet at the Venice Film Festival, Italian jet setter Marina Cicogna is among stars like actress Emma Stone, actor Michael Keaton, and composer Alexandre Desplat, who is jury president at this year's event. Cicogna is in her element. I mean, the Venice Film Festival is my home. I grew up here. My grandfather invented this festival, and uh, so it's been all my life. So it doesn't, it doesn't evoke anything except the pleasure of being here again. She first experienced the Venice Lido as a child in the company of her grandfather, Giuseppe Volpi. It was back in the 1930s that the wealthy politician and businessman decided to stage a film festival around the Hotel Excelsior. Uh, he realized that there were a lot of actors from Hollywood that used to come here on vacation, and he would give a ball and everything, and then he, he heard about this new uh, success of this media called movies. So he went there where the pool, where the pool of the Excelsior was. They put uh, 50 chairs or something, brought down a screen there, and that's when they started the first film festival in 1932. Photographs of the festival remind Chiconia of her own youth. For example, how she first met the Italian acting legend Alberto Sordi. He is coming into my cabin, and that's me here, here. This was my boyfriend at the time. Soon she was being photographed with the likes of directors Lucino Visconti, Federico Fellini, and actor Marcello Mostriani. In 1966, Ciccogna truly launched her career as a movie producer. The secret of producing is to find the right material and the right director and the right actors. And I was friends with them before I started producing with them, yes. I started producing with them, I was already friends. At the Venice Film Festival, Marina Ciccogna is swept up in a whirlwind of parties. There are plenty and she's invited to them all. But they're nothing like the events she used to put on herself. She recalls one when she celebrated her Golden Lion win for producing the 1967 film Belle du Jour. The whole film world was there, from Elizabeth Taylor, Bert, Jane Fonda, Vadim, uh, 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 Kathleen and uh, The party was for three directors that I had that were showing their films here, Visconti, Binuel and Pasolini. Jane was doing Barbarella, Elizabeth and Burton were doing a film and, and you know, it was just happened at the time. I sent them little, small little Learjets, they came, and they, they spent the weekend on Nazis, came with a boat. She always recorded such moments with her own camera and has published a book of her snapshots showing film stars out of the limelight. Audrey Hepburn and Yul Brynner sunbathing. Or Elizabeth Taylor having her hair done. You've got Maria Callas in a, in a bathing suit showing, uh, you know, showing off the, the boat of Anasis. You've got uh, Garbo on Anasis' boat, you know, doing gymnastics. I mean, you know, just pictures of people. The only thing is my pictures are not so great uh, technically, but what they have is they have a life in them and, then, and a natural um, a spontaneity. Fashion designer Valentino and top directors Bernardo Bertolucci, Pierpaolo Pasolini, and Federico Fellini. 
Chaconia's photos offer an authentic insight into the Italian Dolce Vita of the 1960s. What was the special fluid of a time? Well, that's hard to tell, you know, you have, uh, that's one of the reasons, you, you know, that's very visual. You, you have to see the photographs, you have to see the films that one made at that time. You know, um, it was a period when culture and beauty and uh, a lot of wonderful things, music, all that, were very important. Even at the age of 80, Marina Cicogna still plays an active role at the Venice Film Festival. She's still driven by the desire to add a bit of glamour to the world of cinema. Well, from the glamour of the festival, we head back to basics and take a look at the playground activity of swinging. From this, a trendy extreme sport has developed in Estonia and it's called keeking. It involves swinging 360 degrees over a steel frame on arms of varying lengths. And the longer the telescopic arms are, the more challenging the sport becomes. One big push. And you're off. This is keeking, an extreme sport from Estonia. It's like swinging, except you go much higher, even over the top. You hold on to metal arms that extend up to eight meters. This is like you come down and you want to do something and you have such energy. And uh, that adrenaline to get uh, this is really, really good. Like uh, it's getting uh, get high without drugs, and uh, it's um, addictive. On this day, Yavakendi, a village some 100 kilometers south of the Estonian capital Tallinn, is hosting a keeking competition. Men, women, and children try their luck on the swings of different heights that are anchored to the ground with ropes. This unusual sport, derived from regular swinging, was invented in 1996 by Estonian Ardu Kosk. I've been familiar with swings since I was a child. Where I grew up, there were iron loop-the-loop -loop swings which really impressed me. So I had the idea of building a swing like this, and these village swings served as models. Swings enjoy a long tradition in Estonia. These drawings date from the 19th century. Each village used to have a big wooden swing, which functioned as a meeting place. Many of these traditional swings are still around today. Alari Vatra lives in Tallinn. He tried keeking for the first time four years ago. The Estonian capital boasts plenty of swings. Here at the city's playgrounds, children learn the basics of keeking. From here, it starts. Children get the uh, basic uh, how to use his, his, their hands and legs. Of course, it's fun, and, and uh, with fun comes sport. Back in Yevakendi, they ensure the athletes' hands and feet are well secured. That's because centrifugal force makes it hard for them to hold on. Even if it looks dangerous, organizer Aunt Tame says keeking is a very safe sport. Everybody can do it. If you are a small child, if you are a, I don't know, basketball player, the age is not important, the gender is not important. Kicking, as simple as it seems, harder than you ever can imagine, more extreme, but still safe enough to try and to try it for everybody. It's important to warm up in advance, as keeking gives the back and thigh muscles a real workout. For the women, the arms of the swing are up to six meters long. That's like performing a handstand more than 10 meters above the ground. I'm afraid of heights, but uh, nobody believes it, really. But when you are uh, on swing, then you forget it. Here, seven athletes manage to loop the loop with a swing length of more than six meters. That takes strength, coordination, and good timing. 
In the end, world record holder Ernst Tame beat his personal best, but lost his title. Kasper Timeshow, a professional rower from Liliandi, managed a 360-degree rotation with a length of 7.08 metres. That's five centimetres higher than the previous benchmark set in 2012. A new Keking world record. Now, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the German capital is continuing to grow and develop. At the moment, though, there are still a lot of empty spaces and buildings around. Artists and photographers love these derelict places as they provide unique locations for photo shoots. We joined a trip to one of these so-called lost spaces that's located in the very south of Berlin. <laughs> The officer's house is a complex of five buildings in Wunsdorf, south of Berlin. After World War II, when Soviet troops were stationed here, locals called the area the Forbidden City. Germans were not allowed to enter it, and it's still off limits. But not for Andreas Brutger. He runs an agency that offers photography tours of abandoned places. He has permission from the owners to take pictures of subjects like this statue of Lenin. The complex is well guarded, so I feel very special to be allowed in here today to get a closer look at these spaces and discover their aesthetic side. The complex is about 100 years old. It was built under the Kaiser as a military sports facility, at the time Europe's largest. Military officers used to live here. You can still see that from the impressive staircase. I can still see and sense traces of this building's original purpose. You can tell people used to walk around here, that it was used militarily, a place where outsiders never had access. And today it's almost mystical. After the high command of the Soviet armed forces moved in, in the 1950s, up to 60,000 soldiers lived in Wunsdorf, earning it the nickname Little Moscow. Rickety wooden steps lead to the top of the tower in the officer's house. The building was basically left on its own, in peace in a way. And you can see in every tiny corner that time has simply stood still here. From up here, you can see the building that once housed a gymnasium. In the 1950s, the gymnasium became a concert hall and theater, evidence of the many different uses that the buildings have had in their 100-year history. Under the Kaiser, when it was built, it was originally a military school. But after around 1936, under the Nazis, it was the German Army High Command. And athletes were also trained here, for example, for the 1936 Olympics. And after the war, the Russians came and used the building more for ceremonial purposes. But in an adjacent building, one sports venue has survived. The indoor swimming pool. Only the water is now missing. Soldiers swam here in imperial times as part of the program to toughen them up. The soldiers did toughen themselves up here, but they also had instruction. You have to remember it was also a sports school. They didn't just do their military service here, it was a school. And many soldiers must have felt lonely. Postcards addressed to their families bear witness to that. They wrote them in Zutterlin, a form of German handwriting that's no longer in use and hard to decipher. Received your lovely letter. Please forgive me for not having been in touch. I get goosebumps. There's such an atmosphere, so much emotion when the soldiers wrote to their loved ones. And you can still read it today when you see the old stamps on the envelopes and the lines they pen so lovingly. At the end of his journey into the past, Andreas Brutker saves his documentation on the officer's house. What's going to happen to the buildings is unclear, 
Their owner, the state of Brandenburg, is seeking a buyer and a new use for the complex. But until an investor can be found, time will continue to stand still here. Well, the time is still ticking here in the studio, and that means we've come to the end of the show. Do hope you can join us again soon, but for now, take care and goodbye.